I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can join our mailing list and access premium content at CapitalAllocators.com. All opinions expressed by Ted and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of capital allocators or their firms. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of capital allocators or podcast guests may maintain positions in securities discussed on this podcast. My guest on today's show is James Aitken, the founder of Aitken Advisors, a one-man macroeconomic consultancy based in Wimbledon, England, that works with 100 of the most influential pools of capital in the world. James has been a repeat guest on the show. Our very first conversation five years ago, including his background and process, and the most recent one last year are replayed in the feed. If you search on the podcast page at capitalallocators.com, you can find the rest of his appearances. Our conversation this time around covers the precarious setup from fiscal and monetary policy. We turn to attractive opportunities arising from it in the U.S. industrial complex, Japan, and the U.K., and risks on the horizon from volatility targeting, unprofitable businesses, illiquid exposures, and the absence of governments willing to embrace pain. We close with James's thoughts on his home country of Australia and, for the first time, how he's making his research more broadly available. Before we get going, we wanted to help you come down from what might have been an intoxicating July 4th celebration here in the U.S., a part of a six-week summer break in Europe, a food coma-induced siesta in Latin America, or a drunken bash just for the sake of it anywhere in the world. The somewhat crappy, non-summer-like recent weather in the Northeast aside, there may be no better way to sober up than listening to this week's macroeconomic picture from one of our go-to strategists on the show, James Aitken. His soothing Australian accent can set you at ease, even if the warnings of what could come next may not. So sober up, have a listen, and search for the opportunities that let you keep the party rolling. And when you're out there partying, don't forget to tell your mates to tune into Capital Allocators to hunt for the good and warn about the bad in capital markets worldwide. Thanks so much for spreading the word. Please enjoy my conversation with James Aitken. James, so great to see you. Very nice to see you, Ted. Well, it's confusing times, and so I would love to start by asking you, what is most on your client's mind? It's like every family car journey, are we there yet? That's the number one question, are we there yet? Is monetary policy sufficiently restrictive? How should I think about credit, growth stocks? How should I think about opportunities? Are we there yet? Is there a rising probability that central bankers can finally signal mission accomplished? So yeah. Are we there yet? It's the number one challenge for all of us. Is it safe to take on more risks? Should we be more defensive? Have we outlawed recessions? All these kind of questions. And it's been a very remarkable three years and a very remarkable 18 months, because I don't think any of us would have imagined that in the context of the most rapid rate hikes any of us have experienced, that the fallout of that could be so limited. Let's break it down. And start with those hikes. How are you thinking about the monetary policy action and the fiscal policy action happening at the same time? Perhaps we should go back a little bit in time just to set the scene because it's difficult and it's certainly different. And this is just a very rough high-level survey. For 20-plus years, monetary policy was the only game in town because fiscal policy could not be turned on. Fiscal policy was reluctant to be deployed or couldn't be deployed. And that unfortunately meant that central banks, to avoid disinflation and liquidation of risk assets, were compelled to do things that central banks were never designed to do, out of necessity. And the irony today, Ted, is that monetary policy is still the only game in town but ironically, because fiscal policy can now not be turned off 
And if you and I and anybody listening were looking for a guaranteed way to bring inflation down to where people are more comfortable with it, well, the most abrupt way of doing it is not by saying, oh, maybe we need to hike, maybe we need to do this with policy rates. It's to turn the fiscal spigots off. There's not much of that on display right now, least of all in the United States, where, frankly, fiscal policy is all in as far as the eye can see. So I'd say that's one of the primary differences here, or as I said earlier, ironies that for 20 years, monetary policy was the only game in town because fiscal policy could not be turned on. And monetary policy is now the only game in town because fiscal policy can't be turned off. And quite frankly, Ted, because the fiscal response to the COVID situation was so huge, and we did things that we never thought we could do, which is direct fiscal transfers to households and businesses. I'm afraid what that has probably done is reset expectations of what fiscal policy can do and how it can be deployed in future downturns. So now it's out of the box. Fiscal policy is probably going to be more proactive and generally stimulative. And that makes it incrementally more difficult for all our central bank friends. So that's just to set the scene. The other thing that's been on my mind is we talk about nominal policy rates and this, that, and the other, and yet financial history guides us that you're unlikely to arrest an inflation problem with peak negative real policy rates. And it's only as we turned into the late first quarter and second quarter of 2023 that, for example, the real Fed funds rate turned positive. And the reason I've been thinking about real policy rates a lot is as you look at the seven big disinflations in the United States since 1951, the end of the Treasury Fed Accord, those big disinflations only occurred, unsurprisingly, when the real Fed funds rate or predecessor equivalents were notably positive, which makes a lot of sense. It would be unlikely for the Fed to have arrested this inflation problem with peak negative real policy rates, or frankly, a real Fed funds rate anywhere below what we've seen over the last, say, 20 years, just as it would be unlikely for the ECB, the Bank of England, the RBA to arrest this inflation problem with what are currently negative real policy rates of anywhere between minus 200 and minus 400. In other words, we're still groping for sufficiently restrictive monetary policy. But the sting in the tail is that as 2023 goes on, central banks will continue to hike at a somewhat slower place. They know that. They're not shying away from it. Inflation will continue to drift lower somewhat, although it's still arguably far too sticky. And as 2023 goes on, therefore, real policy rates will continue to increase, most notably in the United States, And by the end of 2023, we could end up with a real Fed funds rate that is as high as anything we've seen at least since 2006. And you'd imagine that eventually that's probably going to subdue the animal spirits that are manifest everywhere today. I mean, look, I've come in every morning since the start of this year, turned on my Bloomberg and somewhat to my surprise, it's a sea of green every day. James, I want to ask, going back to Macroeconomics 101, the relationship of monetary policy and the economy, is this thought that you raise rates, money comes out, you have the reverse multiplier effect. You lower rates, creates the stimulus, you have a multiplier effect in the economy, banks lend money. How does the multiplier effect work when there is this persistent fiscal stimulus and you're trying to temper the economy? Well, isn't that a good question? Let's think that through. If we were to sketch how tighter monetary policy feeds through to the real economy, in the US and frankly, most levered economies, it's the cost of borrowing goes up. It's more expensive to refinance your mortgages. In general, financial conditions tighten, meaning stocks drift and sometimes head a lot lower. You've got a rising risk premium in credit. And basically, when the consumer looks at their monthly statement, they say, gee whiz, our household net worth has peaked. It's coming down. 
I probably should restrain consumption. And then that tends to feed on itself and ideally brings you in for a nice, gentle, soft landing, except that there's not much history of that. But really, the key thing is it tends to work through household balance sheets, the consumer and consumption in general. And sometimes it works in a spectacular way, as we saw in 2007 and 2008. So first and foremost, that's the transmission mechanism, the cost of lending to households and the real economy in general. Well, what's interesting, at least over the past 12 months, is that we saw the immediate response from interest rate sensitive sectors of all sorts of Western economies as wage went up. You know, the usual things went bump in the night. There was a bit mortgage costs went up. Household balance sheets felt a little bit more constricted. Consumption slowed a little bit and so on and so forth. But that channel isn't quite working in the same way because guess what? US households in particular are not stupid. They can see around them that inflation's going up. They can see that borrowing rates are probably going to go up. And guess what? A vast number of them termed out their funding, which was very smart indeed. This is a very tentative observation, but unlike most spectacularly 2006 to 2008, perhaps the elasticity of US household balance sheets and US household consumption to rising Fed rates is much lower simply because US households appear to have termed out their funding. And then when we compare historical episodes of US households being overextended, not just with mortgages, but with credit cards and everything else, they're in very good shape compared to any time, certainly in the past 20 years in terms of credit card borrowings and this, that and the other. Now, of course, we're already seeing plenty of evidence of people who completely misjudge the cycle, such as Silicon Valley Bank and others. They're paying the price. And there will be people who get into strife, whether it be commercial mortgage-backed mortgages. We can go down the usual checklist. But in aggregate, quite remarkably, this is a US economy that is still on fire. The pass-through effect this time, if the Fed's going to succeed in bringing inflation down back to target levels, it's going to have to be more persistent and more hawkish, I would argue, than any of us have experienced. And if on the one hand, the Fed taketh away, and on the other, President Biden giveth, then effectively, it's like running a heater and an air conditioner at the same time. And there is no overstating the profound impact of this Inflation Reduction Act. It is just starting to be felt. It seems every marginal dollar of Western CapEx coming into the United States because the tax subsidies are so generous, not to mention all the skilled workers and everyone else required. But the multiplier effect of that is just beginning to be felt and will be felt for many, many years to come, no matter what happens in November 24. So look, how to break down your question, it would seem at this stage that this isn't a rerun of 06, 07, 08, or any previous housing channel slowdown. It's part of the reason is fiscal policy is all in as far as the eye can see. I mean, I'll just say in brackets that to see the US budget deficit at 8% of GDP now before any recession is deeply unsettling. Deeply unsettling when the US still largely relies on the kindness of strangers who may not be as excited about treasury bonds as they were 10 years ago. But look, fiscal policy all in at the most basic level means that monetary policy has to do more of the heavy lifting. We remain fast and sufficiently restrictive. And I'll just say my intuition would be that the Fed hoped that they would have stopped hiking by now, not just paused or skipped or any of this other jargon. I'm pretty confident the Fed hoped that they would be able to stop hiking by the end of the first quarter of 2023, pause, look around, wait for the lagged impacts of monetary policy to bite. So we're getting the softening that we expected. We're getting a slight loosening in the labour market. We're getting a slight increase in continuing jobless claims, continuing claims in the US. We're seeing slight tightness in terms of lending to the real economy. But by and large, this juggernaut keeps powering on, and it's absolutely remarkable to watch.
the counter to the idea that the consumer's elasticity to the Fed rate hikes is much less than it had been is that the banks, by definition, are upside down. To the extent the consumers termed out their mortgage, the bank is now underwater on a mark-to-market basis. We saw that in SVB and the others. So the bank is usually the core of the multiplier effect. How is that going to play out when the Fed, as you mentioned, needs to keep rates hiking to cool the economy, but the higher the rates, the more many of these bank balance sheets are upside down? Let's see if we can answer that with a little bit of financial history, which is the savings and loan crisis. And it's similar but different. You know, that, that's the lesson of financial history. It, it never tells us anything. It merely suggests a frame of reference if we try to untangle complicated things. So this savings and loan crisis suggests that what you tend to see is the initial wobble where a couple of the most poorly risk-managed institutions get into difficulty. So the savings and loan crisis blew up in 1982. No surprise, similar reasons. You had a cap on deposits. Mr. Volcker put rates up a lot. And unsurprisingly, the deposits left certain savings and loans institutions for higher yields. Oh, guess what? We're upside down. Whoops. So it broke out in 1982. And then nothing happened. Although it was helped a bit by Mr. Volcker being a bit more dovish. There was another mini eruption in 1984 where Congress tried to fudge it and bizarrely said the SNL should take more risk. But the SNL crisis wasn't eventually resolved until 1989. And there are some similarities here, but for different reasons. I mean, I'm certainly one of those people who think post Silicon Valley Bank, the delta on the willingness of every US bank, but particularly the smaller ones, to lend to the real economy, it has to be negative. It just has to be in terms of capacity and obviously in terms of the cost. So we know the delta, but it's extraordinary when you look over the Fed's weekly data on small bank lending, loans and leases and this, that and the other, and it's started to tick up again. Smaller banks are seeing deposit inflow. So it may not be great for bank earnings, but there's a hint that we can muddle through here for longer than people may expect. And just to add to that, I think people overlooked just how generous the Fed's bank term funding program was. Imagine you and I were somewhat slow-witted bank treasurers. Uh Uh-oh, we've got all these treasuries on our balance sheet that are not worth par, they're worth 75. Oh, Jay Powell said, here's a new facility. Bring all your treasuries to us at face value for a 5% fee. Well, that's a no-brainer. We just take our entire balance sheet of treasuries to our friendly local regional Fed and say, here you go, son. So it's no surprise that that generous facility acted as a giant firebreak. And then in the second instance, something that's still little commented on today is that the Fed provided a bridge loan to the tune of $212 billion to the FDIC's bad bank. Now, Ted, that is not surprising, but it's still breathtaking in its scale. And I think the most interesting part of that compared to years gone by is that there was not one peep from Congress on either side of the aisle about the generosity of the Fed's response to ring-fencing, sandbagging Silicon Valley Bank. So the point here is that so successful has the Fed's backstop of regional banks and so forth been that it has not only prevented the accelerating tightening of credit we all expected after Silicon Valley Bank, it's actually incentivized banks to be calm, be measured, and to keep lending where appropriate to their clients. It's a remarkable thing indeed. And the perversity of it for the Fed is frankly that so successful has this bailout been, so generous, that they're probably going to end up taking the Fed funds rate to a level that none of them actually imagined when they started 2023. This gets us into you know, from the what in your vernacular to the so what. And let me start that with something I always scratch my head in trying to understand, which is what you've just described is the Fed assuming 
let's just call it at best mark to market losses at banks. Someone has to take these losses. We do have this 8% deficit. Where does this go? How long can you keep socializing these losses without what seems like a political will to either raise taxes or rein in budgets such that eventually you can pay off these losses? One of my clients reminded me yesterday of the difference between emerging markets and developed markets. And he said, in a crisis, emerging markets see their yields go up. And in a crisis, developed markets see their yields go down. The reason being that developed markets, by and large, are permitted by reason of standing to print their way out of trouble. And that's generally true of developed markets. When there's a crisis, because there's perceived policy credibility Yields tend to fall, and unsurprisingly, in the world's reserve currency, the United States has benefited from exactly that. But it feels a bit different this time because, again, that budget deficit situation, the US relying on the kindness of strangers, some of the biggest recyclers of dollars do not appear to be terribly in love with US treasuries anymore. And then you've got these growing socialised losses You have high inflation. In the background, I hear every day all these voices saying, oh, yes, don't worry. The Fed will be compelled to do yield curve control to peg the Treasury curve. That's how we get out of Dodge. And I'm like, well, okay, if we dare to believe that the Fed is going to be the money printer of first resort and basically buy the entire Treasury curve, where does that put the dollar? That's all to be resolved in the future. But of course, you're asking the right question. Socialization of losses is one thing. But I wonder if it all boils down to one simple thing. The ability to deploy fiscal policy may not be down to whether you're the world's reserve currency or not. The ability to deploy fiscal policy in scale or just fund or or socialize losses depends on your ability to roll over all your sovereign debt at a fairly predictable, fairly low rate. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. And we've all grown up in this environment of declining inflation, declining interest rates, during which, with the exception, infamously, of certain emerging markets, the ability of developed markets to refinance themselves has never been called into question. But we've never had a starting position such as we have today. So to answer your question about how long is it possible for the US to socialise losses or effectively what's the capacity of the Fed to underwrite every wobble in the financial system whilst they continue to fight the inflation fight, the argument from the central bankers would be, well, there's no problem. We're doing our job. This is how it works, you know, deploying our balance sheet, wearing our financial stability hat. In brackets, don't ask us how we miss Silicon Valley Bank. We'll get back to you. That's all could be a bit challenged in years to come. But then let's not get too tinfoil out about it. Let's just focus on something important, which is incentives. Let's take a topical example. Here in the UK right now, despite everything people read about the inflation problem, the haplessness of the Bank of England, all of which is true, UK private banks and high net worth individuals are falling over themselves to buy gilts. Yeah, quite shocking, right? Very simple reason. Gilts are the munis of sovereign debt. We all know about the tax attractiveness of muni bonds in the US, but gilts, there's no capital gains tax on gilts for UK taxpayers. And there are a whole bunch of short dated gilts out there trading at very hefty discounts with very low coupons that the private banks and high net worth individuals in this country are piling into because it's a very tax efficient deposit account. And that's logical. The reason I bring that up is because incentives matter. And for the first time in, let's say, roughly 25 years, Ted, you and I and everyone listening, we're paid not to have a view because money is not free anymore. If interest rates are zero, then we have to have a view all the time. 
because any decision to step out of risk assets, no matter what the risk asset is, is a career decision if you're not paid to wait. Well, that's completely flipped on its head. If you and I can get the best part of five and a half, six percent on a UST bill, we don't need to have a view on all these things. We're like, you know what? We are paid to wait. And that gets me to your question. Who's going to buy all these bonds that the United States is selling in 2023, 2024, 2025 with a rising budget deficit before the recession comes? And my answer is everybody. Everybody. You give people the right incentive, the right coupon, they will buy it. That gets us into another difficult subject, which is if savings, whether they do domestic or global savings, are going to crowd in because the yield is so tempting to sovereign paper. They're going to crowd out, if you will, of other things. And that's why the years to come are so complicated, because if we're going to be choking the world with sovereign bonds, and some countries are deficit countries and others are surplus countries, boy, oh boy, someone's going to have to take down a lot of debt. And I think at the right price, it could frankly be you and I. Well, let's take that and walk through getting into the markets, what you see as some opportunities and risks from this environment. And, and why don't we start with the opportunities so it's not all gloom and doom? That's actually a really good point. It's never all doom and gloom, is it? It never is. And as you told me when we had that lovely lunch a month ago, the hardest day to invest is today. It's always that, oh, it's so hard to invest. No, it isn't. Somehow people have coped with investing for centuries, Ted. How on earth did they do it? And as we all know, there's been a whole lot worse things happening in the world than are happening today. It's not to negate some of the challenges we face, but boy, oh boy, there's been some much more difficult investing environments than June 2023. So the hardest day to invest is today. And the hardest thing to do when everyone is jumping up and down and screaming like they are today is to keep an open mind. And I think I said to you in one of our earliest discussions that as much as everyone thinks macro is what's going wrong, it's so important to keep a view of the right tail of the distribution in macro, which is what's going right or what could be going right. And it's harder and harder to do when everyone's on recession, Ross, but that's okay. So let's run through a few practical things. If government's going to borrow a lot of money and spend a lot of money, how do I align myself with government? Goes back to the earlier point. I think the multipliers and impact of the Inflation Reduction Act, people are barely beginning to understand how powerful that is. I mean, I was looking at the chart the other day to see the hockey stick in US construction manufacturing spending, it's real. And all these very good industrial companies in the United States and some here in the UK who have US businesses, they're going to have a full order book as far as the eye can see as the ripple effects of the Inflation Reduction Act and the accelerated onshoring of all sorts of manufacturing take hold. Those particular companies, they're probably going to be in good shape, generating high free cash flow, not only defending, but growing their moats. They're going to have to hire. They're going to have to build. It's going to be expensive. It's going to be difficult, but it's going to happen. And it's just started to happen because recession or not, this is a structural feature of our investment world that's going to be with us for many years to come. So we mustn't lose focus on that. Right now, unless other Western jurisdictions respond with similar generosity, which some of them have tried to do, Ted, the rescue is for the rest of 2023 and beyond, every marginal dollar of industrial capex, not to mention energy transition capex, gets spent in the United States because the incentives are so strong. So I'm watching that with great interest. Within that, what are you hearing of some of the favorite ways to play that theme? There are certain ETFs, there are certain businesses, people are looking at specific businesses that are doing the build out the fluors, the schlumbergers, insert any major US industrial supplier here, the warehouses, you know, all that sort of thing, even the steel. One example I've been looking at over the past three months is a UK company named Ashted, 
they have a very, very strong U.S. business, Sunbelt Rentals. Ashted gave their earnings up. They presented all sorts of charts on the spillovers of the Inflation Reduction Act. And to see a list of all these, frankly, not mega projects, but hyper projects that are coming out is absolutely staggering and whisper it. But this is the sort of industrial capex you normally only see in wartime. It's immense. So whether it be an Ash, Ted, or certain of those other names, they, to me, seem very well placed to take advantage of this. And then there'll also be other businesses that will be required to train up the workforce and everything else. So there's a whole range of multiples. And by the way, I should add, Ted, that it's not just the Inflation Reduction Act at the federal level. There are also many states providing similar incentives, but this is one of the most profoundly impactful fiscal programs that we've seen in a long, long time. And frankly, if Mr. Trump had announced the Inflation Reduction Act, the world would be jumping up and down, screaming, claiming it was a trade war. Somehow, Mr. Biden has avoided that. I'm not sure if it's by luck or by design, but it's not going away. How about some opportunities that you're seeing outside the US? Oh, there's plenty. It's often interesting to spend time on the things that are less discussed. One of those that's been on the top of my list for some months is Japan. And I don't mean the debate about the Bank of Japan and yield curve control, although that's important. I don't mean the debate in Japan about inflation, although that's important, nor the yen. It's just this really strong structural tailwind in Japan as a result of friendshoring, as Janet Yellen calls it, or moving more manufacturing to like-minded national partners and so forth. Japan is well-placed there. But there's something else, Ted. There's this amazing story of reform in Japan over the past several years, restructuring dormant companies, giving them a good kicking. Well, if you want to be listed and you keep having all this cash on your balance sheet and you're not doing anything with it, I'm sorry, we're going to have to delist you, short yourselves out. One of the happiest hunting grounds for one private equity firm over the past decade has been Japan because they've been able to buy and restructure all these businesses in line exactly with the late Mr. Abe and the current Kushida are interested in, which is this restructuring of corporate Japan, making it fit for purpose. It's like the Inflation Reduction Act. There's a structural tailwind there that's not about macroeconomics per se, but is going to persist no matter the politics in Japan, no matter recession, this, that, and the other. And I think that's certainly worth watching. So Japanese equities, and to be clear, not just because Mr. Buffett got there first, which is nearly always the case. He's done famously well with his trading houses because he understood the economics or his team did better than anyone else. There's a whole range of world-class businesses in Japan that have progressively been re-rated, and I would expect that to get more popular, not just over the remainder of this year, but beyond, particularly if the yen turned around for any reason. So I'm watching Japan. I'm also watching the UK. Things are a little bit difficult over here. There's been many, many years of policy failure on both sides. Hard decisions have been avoided. Bad choices have been made, and as ever, it must all be down to Brexit. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it's not a good starting position to be in. And unsurprisingly, despite Sterling's recent strength, UK assets are unloved. But boy, oh boy, there's some bargains around. And this is not necessarily a liquid option, but so keen are UK pension funds to de-risk of their growthy, liquid portfolios. So concerned are they that the UK will get into a very difficult recession over the next six months or so, that there are tremendous discounts available in secondary markets for UK institutional property funds right now. I won't mention the exact discounts, but I'm just seeing very good appetite, ongoing interest from what I'd call global patient capital to provide liquidity to these desperate UK pension funds. And to be clear, the UK pension funds are not saying, oh my gosh, it's all going to hell. There are specific structural reasons, liquidity reasons, why these UK pension funds are getting out. But the discounts are enormous. 
And the implied default rate on UK property in these funds is worse than anything seen in 08. So unsurprisingly, the world's patient capital is like, well, I think I better have a bit of that because by the time UK rates have peaked and the world muddles through two, three years out, you know, those discounts won't be there. So I'm looking at that with interest in addition to gilts, as I mentioned, but that's more for UK domiciled taxpayers. The rest of the world's a bit tricky. I won't bore your listeners with it today, but I still have a bee in my bonnet about exposure to Remnimby assets. I'll just say generally that the right size exposure to Remnimby assets is zero, and perhaps that's something we should take up in another conversation ahead of the Taiwanese presidential elections. But look, it's trying to calibrate for are we there yet with regards to monetary policy when fiscal policy is all in? Is monetary policy sufficiently restrictive? Have we done enough to tighten financial conditions and arrest animal spirits in order to confidently signal mission accomplished on inflation? And the answer appears to be no. And there will be more assets that get shaken down to nobody's surprise. There will be more credit markets that get tight. There will be more stocks that have big earnings, air swings. All of that's to be expected. And I think the challenge for all of us is to keep an open mind about it. Imagine the great assets that we might yet be able to buy. And obviously, I'm revealing my bias. But here we are with all these hikes. We've had a bare flutter of derating, repricing and everything else. Some markets have got very tight. But it strikes me that we're very far from some kind of investable bottom. But that's okay because we are now paid to wait. And that's the big difference. So, look, I'm still looking around, keeping an open mind, focused on the UK, because, frankly, some of my largest clients are correctly focused on deeply discounted, long-lived assets here in the UK. I haven't talked about the energy transition, but I think you know my priors there. But look, there's one other point that we might wish to bring up here. We're having a discussion, as are many, many, many people around the world today, about fundamentals, about bottom-up, top-down, some of the issues the world is facing. In other words, we're having a discretionary fundamental conversation about how the world works and wonder how we might decide to deploy our capital. And yet the facts are that if you and I, Ted, decide we're going to buy some listed asset today. Well, we're going to be 5 to 10% of the turnover because the way the world works today is that the flow is dominated by the machines. And that's not a criticism at all. It's just the reality, whether it be volatility, targeting, quantum mental, you name it. So many assets that trade today, particularly the most liquid ones, they're not about the business. They're not about the QSIP. They're more about, A, is the turnover large enough for me to get in and out? And B, does it tick a box? Is that a value stock? Is it a growth stock? Is it quality? And that's the world we're in. And look, I could have the most perfect view on the Fed or all these other things. It doesn't really matter. There is so much money in these quantum metal strategies that it's as simple as if implied volatility is coming down for any reason then these strategies need to add more risk. And that is exactly what's happening. But it's more than that. It used to be volatility targeting, solve for volatility, adjusted returns, et cetera. So big has this quantum metal industry become that, of course, in the background, it's solve for volatility, adjusted returns, hit the target. But it's more and more about how much dollar risk do I need to deploy to hit those targets? And is it any wonder, therefore, that we're seeing this colossal dispersion between the largest, most liquid stocks and everything else? There's more and more money coming in as volatility comes down into the most liquid stocks. But then at some point, that's all going to turn around. We don't know when. But boy, oh boy, that's going to be a lively couple of days when that happens. So just to flag, it's important to have these discussions. Of course it is. It's important to 
touch upon some of the key issues and try and think about what's going right and wrong. But the facts are that in this day and age, so many movements in asset classes are dictated by volatility scaling and so big have these risk machines become that it's more about dollar quantity that they can put on and then eventually take off. And we mustn't lose sight of that. Doesn't mean they're always right, but it adds a new dimension to how we should think about markets. I'm watching all of that with great interest because as ever, the banks have decided to replicate all of that as well and offer all of that to their private clients. What could go wrong? Let's go to what could go wrong. And we talked about some of the right tales. You gave a little hint of (laughs) Renminbi target allocation zero as a left tail. And now we're talking about what feels like the wily coyote after chasing the roadrunner, maybe going off the volatility cliff and then saying, whoops, down below. So those are two little examples, maybe not so little. What are you most concerned about today in the markets that you see? At the highest level, it's a very simple one. You have no idea what sufficiently restrictive monetary policy is until you are beyond it. That's the tricky thing. And if the Fed is genuine about risk management with regards to inflation, the Fed is incentivized to overdo it. I mean, let's think about the 2009 to 2019 period because there wasn't much inflation. From a risk management perspective, if in doubt, the Fed was strongly incentivized to be dovish, which they were. And that's flipped. If in doubt, you keep going. And it's not that cliche until something breaks. You keep going until you see evidence, not in advance, in arrears, that tighter monetary policy and higher real policy rates are starting to bite. You're seeing some softening in the US labor market, a little bit of tightening of credit for the real economy, but nowhere near enough to signal the all clear on inflation. I mean, we'll see, like 7% Fed funds or something. We're obviously not there yet. And hand in hand with sufficiently restrictive monetary policy is wider credit spreads. But there's one intermediate point, which I regret I've neglected until now, but it's important in flagging the left tail of what could go wrong. Very roughly speaking, we had 20 years in the US where nominal GDP was about 4%, inflation was about 2%, which meant that you had real GDP of about 2%. Now, fast forward to the last three years, we've had so much stimulus that nominal GDP in the US and many other countries was very high. And even though it's come off the 2022 levels, nominal GDP in the United States is still running about 6%. So we're still two handles above what we saw over the previous 20 years, roughly. Now, Ted, the reason that's important is because if nominal GDP is mid to high single digits or comfortably higher than we've seen in the past, the economy as a whole is going to be generating more than adequate cash flow to service all its debts. It makes perfect sense if nominal GDP is stronger that credit markets in aggregate will be pretty well behaved. It also makes sense that the stock market in general will be pretty well behaved. There'll be dispersion between winners and losers, but overall it'll be okay because nominal GDP is high. It makes sense. So what's the point there? Let's invert your question. How would we cook up a meal of a very left tail event where I turn on the Bloomberg and it's not green, it's red, 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 red. Well, firstly, you got to take the real Fed funds rate at least back to where it was in 06. So let's say 250 to 300 basis points. Hand in hand with that, you're starting to see the lagged impact of monetary policy tightening arrive. You see a further loosening in the US labor markets. You see some kind of rising default premium and credit. But most of all, you need to arrest consumption and you need to get nominal GDP down. A real Fed funds rate of 250 for reasons of illustration and nominal GDP coming back from six to five to four, that's really going to hurt. And it will hurt earnings, it will hurt consumption and everything else. And I think my sense is that investors are going to be surprised by how hard the Fed needs to lean into this 
We may have another quarter for mechanical reasons where asset prices do okay, just because implied volatility is coming down. But as we get into the back end of 2023, my best guess is no later than early fourth quarter. That's a guess. The cumulative impact of hikes starts to bite. The consumer starts to retrench a little. Continuing claims are heading up. The labor market keeps softening and things just get a little bit squeezy and a bit tighter. And that's all to play for. So for me, the real left tail is that all of that just arrives in one lump. Monetary policy is sufficiently restricted. The real Fed funds rate is 250. Credit to the real economy gets increasingly rationed. Labor market starts to loosen. The US consumer starts to retrench. Nominal GDP comes down. And it's all just one big trade, isn't it? It's all one big trade. So in that event where we're seeing red proverbially, bringing the macro to the micro, where are you concerned where we might see the most red? This will shock you. But if you and I had a business that could not generate positive free cash flow over the last three years of the most enormous stimulus in financial history, or we've been unable to generate operating profits during the most generous fiscal and monetary expansion in the universe, we might not be going to make it, Ted. And it's quite surprising to me to see a vast number of still largely profitless companies doing hockey sticks on my Bloomberg. Okay, that's fine. You know, the rule 101, never pick a fight with an upward sloping parabola and all that. You let markets run their course, particularly if there's a machine-driven component. But first and foremost, those are the ones that are going to struggle. It's those profitless companies, no matter what their line of business And if they've been unable to refinance to this point, boy, oh boy, it's going to be a brutal period ahead. So that would be the first thing. The second thing would be, unfortunately, institutions who, by my reckoning, still have too much illiquid exposure. And there's an awful lot of them who felt that because we knew the game, low vol, low interest rates, oh my gosh, I need to take more risk to get to that 7.5% nominal return target bogey. Well, that's all now gone to reverse. If you can get 6% on a T-bill, you just don't need the risk. But it's awfully, awfully difficult to get out of a liquid strategy, which you thought you'd hold for a decade in year six, if there's no bid. In terms of funding markets and plumbing, I don't think there's too much to say at the moment, actually. It's all working surprisingly well, even after Silicon Valley Bank. But of course, for the unprepared, it's going to get incrementally tighter as the year goes on. So anyone who's not tied their dollar funding to the floor is going to find it pretty difficult. But really, for me, it's just unfinished business. It's just trying to think of the obvious parts of the markets that need to derate. I haven't mentioned credit at all because I think that's obvious. I do think for the sophisticated investor, or allocator, there are tremendous hedging opportunities in credit right now to prepare for more difficult or challenging times that won't cost the investor too much. But here's a crazy thought I've been sharing with clients over the past month. I'm just wondering if people have been a bit too blasé in assuming inflation is going to go away. John Major, as he then was, became Chancellor of the Exchequer in the UK and then after Thatcher left office, became Prime Minister. In November 1989, then Mr Major gave a speech in Northampton. And at that particular moment, UK inflation was heading up. It was 7.5%. And Mr Major said, if it isn't hurting, it isn't working. And I turn on my Bloomberg And of course, I can identify pockets of concern, pockets of weakness, much of it obvious, but I turn on that Bloomberg and all I see is green, green, green. It's going to be a very difficult, challenging time. But unfortunately, Mr. Major is correct. And I'm concerned that too many people are tempted to conclude that we've got away with it. We're done, mission accomplished, and I'm not sure that's right. I think we have a lot more work to do here. James, we could easily land the plane there, but 
I'm curious if we should bring it home by bringing you back home, because among the non-consensus things we've discussed, you've been thinking and talking more about Australia of late, and we'd just love to hear your thoughts about why that is important. Well, it's important for very strong personal reasons, as you know, I, I miss it. But I'm glad you brought it up because we have many mutual friends down under. And for the benefit of non-Australian listeners, some of the best asset allocators on earth, full stop. They are tremendously good, thoughtful people. And boy, oh boy, do they command some enormous amounts of money. But I'm taking a renewed interest because I'm looking at a very delicate path ahead for the Australian economy. And no surprises here that Australia loves property. Australians love debt. There is negative gearing on investment property. Basically, over many decades, every Australian has been incentivized to get into property as soon as possible and then just keep going and going. That's the way we play, aided and abetted, of course, by the rise of China, commodity prices, terms of trade and everything else. We've done very well. And we often think of ourselves as the lucky country. Okay, that's generally true. But we face a wee bit of a dilemma because there are wage pressures coming through. There are many more wage gains to be realised. The Reserve Bank of Australia, as they have acknowledged and admitted and apologised for, which is unprecedented, made a mistake coming through COVID by saying that we do not expect to raise policy rates for three years. Well, that's like a red rag to an Australian property bull. You mean interest rates are going to be donut for three years, well, how much property can I buy? Well, guess what? Australia was no different. Australia was not the lucky country. Australia was the same as everyone else. And for listeners in the Northwest Hemisphere, if you think some of the discussion around the hapless Andrew Bailey and his Bank of England is bad, or the ECB, or any other central bank, not to forget the Fed, the domestic discussion around the Reserve Bank of Australia is absolutely awful right now. It's absolutely awful. And when it gets to this sort of level, you normally end up with bad outcomes. That's why I'm talking about it so much. And look, let's face it, Australia is a very small capital market compared to nearly every other market you and I might wish to consider. So yeah, there's a little bit of patriotic, perhaps esoteric interest, but there's something going on there that's pretty messy. And I've got my eye on it. And I'm wondering about what are the opportunities that come out of it? Australia is enormously well-placed to capitalise on the energy transition. So here's the good news, just to keep it balanced. There is a negotiation underway, which could take some time to see whether Australian critical minerals producers could be approved by Congress for participation in US defence procurement. That would be an enormous development Suffice to say, there's a lot of work going on with Singapore, Indonesia, South Korea, Japan, the US about how do we make our supply chains fit for purpose and defence supply chains, critical minerals, energy, all of this is happening in the background. But boy, oh boy, there's a lot of money involved here. But let's face it, Ted, no matter what's happening with the Australian economy, housing prices and everything else, the Opera House will still be there. The Harbour Bridge will still be there. I'll still be able to get my beloved Rose Bay Ferry 13 minutes up the harbour on a sunny morning, past the Opera House, past Point Piper, all these other places. It's just magical. The beers will still be cold. And somewhere around our coastline, the most magic wave will be breaking. So it's not all bad. James, I got one last question to ask you about, which is so different from every other time you've been on the show. Often after you come on, people ask where to find you. And when we first started doing this, there was nowhere to find you unless you were visiting the Wimbledon tennis tournament and you just happened to be up the street. But I know that's changed. So I'd love to just ask you to share what you're doing on the business so that more people can access your thoughts and wisdom. Well, so much of what I am doing with my business has been motivated by our conversations. And in the nicest possible way, Getting to know you has been one of the great butt-kicking exercises of my life. That's it. That's praise. Now that's praise. I mean, how stupid is it that a bloke could run his advisory business for now into year 15, which is unbelievable, 
and have no website. I mean, it's just the dumbest thing ever, but there we are. We built a website, aitkenadvisors.com. And Ted, did you know that if you build a website, it's easier for people to contact you? I had no idea. So as the world's got a bit more difficult over the last 18 months, my phone has been ringing off the hook. It's fantastic. And thanks to your efforts and a couple of other great friends, and boy, it's interesting who's out there. In addition to long-standing clients, there's all sorts of new people out there just trying to understand what's going wrong, what's going right, trying to be less wrong, just be thoughtful and take advantage of, of other people's mistakes in a, in a nice way, right? But then, of course, I realized, hang on, I've done this completely wrong. The most crucial thing for me is to ring fence my reading time, my thinking time, my reflecting time. And the number of requests coming through, all of them fascinating, was starting to enroach on that. And I thought, you know what, I've done this so wrong. I need to invest in the infrastructure of my business. So let's cut to the chase. I've been working on that for the past six months, trying to make my business fit for purpose. It's inconsistent for me to opine on all sorts of assets and this opportunity, and this is a great business. If my own business is not bulletproof in terms of infrastructure technology, all these things matter to be consistent. And this second stage of the journey has been so interesting. What can I do with artificial intelligence? And I've been working on a pilot project with my digital advisors who are fantastic. I've given them gosh, what is now 1,500 editions of Notes from a Small Island. And we've let it loose on this controlled bot, which I now understand you can do internally. And we're just going to let it loose on the data saying, what does Aiken think about collateral? What does Aiken think about inflation? And just let it loose. And the idea is once we're comfortable, we're getting answers that make sense, give my clients the opportunity to create their own searches, where if they're pressed for time, which they all are, and they don't quite have time to keep up with every time I publish, that's okay. You can go in with your approved client and off you go. So for me, the future benefit of AI is having an internal bot on my website. People can type in their queries. The AI generator will give them results and it will help save them time as well as make them think. So... That's what I've been working on. It's been a fascinating educational experience about technology and all these other things, but it all goes back to, look, I'm very lucky to work with unbelievable people all around the world. And I'm always reminding myself that I'm working with immensely time-constrained individuals and my job is to help them think. Well, James, you always do help me think. And I want to thank you again so much for this tour of the world and your current thoughts. Good to see you, Ted. Thanks for your time, mate. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com, where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one, and see you next time.